Well, what a year it's been. <laughs> Twenty twenty, very unusual, unpredictable, but there's been some good things about it. And what I wanted to do in this this late break show video really is to sum up everything that we've done this year. We've this was our first year, so this is going to be our first ever roundup video if it becomes a regular thing. Um, and we've done loads. We've 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 done an awful lot. And um, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that's watched all the videos to now. Um, but I'm just going to break these down, these little um, roundup montages into groups. And this first one is all about EV. So a huge chunk of the late break show is EV. And this year there was a massive amount of EV content launched. I suspect because A, it's 2020 and EVs have come into the market more than ever. But also, I think they were all pushed to the end of the year because of the thing going on in the world. So as a consequence, let's have a quick look at some of the cars that I've reviewed, starting with the Honda E, the first video I put out on the channel and actually my most watched video to date. And then I did the Honda E again versus the old classic Mark I Civic. I've done the Mini E, the Citroen Ami, the e-tron, the Swind E Classic Mini, the Polestar 2, the ID3. I can't remember them all, so I've written them down. The 500E, the E up, other E's. My name's Johnny Smith, and in this episode, I'm going to be driving the most hyped electric car that isn't a Tesla in Spain in a biblical rainstorm. Come join me. This is probably the longest I've ever waited to drive a finished production EV from when I first saw it as a concept. First saw it in 2017. It came out of the Frankfurt Motor Show, a show normally dominated by the Germans, let's face it, and this thing just absolutely destroyed everything around it. Listen, before you start saying, don't compare an old car to a new car, that's not fair. This is not really one of those. This is almost a self-indulgent uh, situation. I've got the chance to drive this car. This was one of the very first launch cars for the Civic when it came out in the UK. So it's the one that was featured in the brochure. I've got the brochure in there, I'll show you. So let's talk about design. Well, if you're familiar with a Mini, it's all very familiar. And Mini have kind of made that clear. They want people to buy a Mini and it just kind of happens to be electric. In the same way that VW have got the Golf with the E-Golf, it's the same but kind of different. And the E-Up, and, and actually the Peugeot 208. And I guess this proves that if you want to shout about being EV, you can. But if you want to just blend into the background and the rest of the commuter traffic here in Oxfordshire, you can. This is a Mini. It just happens to be powered by electricity. OK, put it in forward motion and drive off. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not driven an old Mini for blimmin' yonks. So what is this? Well, it's a classic Mini restored to the customer's own spec if you want to and then it's given the EV treatment. So the A-series transverse engine comes out, the one that had the gearbox built in from minis of old. So under the bonnet of the front there, you've got an 80 kilowatt brushless electric motor that sits really low. As a consequence, the whole car's got a lower center of gravity and it's got a much better weight distribution than the original Mini. This car is an electric VW Up, also known as the E Up. No Yorkshire jokes just no more. They've been done already, about seven years ago. So there's your E-Up, your new gen E-Up, and there's your outgoing E-Golf right there. The E-Up is available as a five door only. So although you can order a normal up as a three door, like the Up GTI, you can't buy the electric one in any other form, body, body shape as this. Let's play a fun game. What happens when Volvo decide to set up a performance sub-brand that only uses EV powertrains and uses all that amazing Scandinavian design language and engineering and also ethical materials? This is what happens. It's a genuine Tesla Model 3 rival and it's called the Polestar 2. 
and I think there's an aeroplane behind me. It's not, it's a six-wheel John Deere Gator with Merlin at the wheel. <laughs> and off we quietly go. Look, look at this. There's so much in terms of different views and technology on this car. Now, I've been driving the e-tron sportback for the last couple of days just with the family doing short journeys a couple of longer journeys driving a bit hard and it's the best way to try and get your head around a new car if you can before doing a, a, a review vid actually do you know what i'm not johnny smith today today i'm going to be thomas shelby i'm going to be thomas shelby in birmingham the home of peaky blinders with the cheeky cento blinder I did say that, and that's the reason why I'm dressed as such a turn-of-the-century fashionista. But the thing is, is I couldn't drive this in Italy, so I brought it to Birmingham because this particular part of Birmingham, back in the 1800s, was known as the Italian Quarter, Little Italy, where a lot of Italian immigrants came. And of course, Peaky Blinders is filmed and set here. And the Shelby family, the Peaky Blinders, were a real gangster family. This clever design of symmetrical panels bringing down the cost of production and making replacing parts and repairs easy. It's great. It's so Citroen. I think this is, this sort of thing is what Citroen was born to do. Citroen's really good at quirky design, but functional, utilitarian. And by very definition of that, it makes it cool, I think. Fit for purpose. Fit for purpose is a term that people don't massively practice anymore, really. So there's all the EV content wrapped up, and I suspect there's going to be only more and more EV content on this channel because I'm interested in it and the world is going to be driving more of it. Now we move on to my own cars, project cars. This is an area which I think people are always intrigued by, what I buy, what I own. So here's a wrap up of the project car videos that I've put out this year, starting with the Honda S600 and my little CZ100 monkey bike. Today I am at Project Heaven, and that's because I'm going to see my little Honda S600 Coupe, a car which I've had for several years now and should have finished it a long time ago, really, but things escalate. Um, but I'm gonna see it running and driving properly for the first time today. I'm hopefully gonna take it out for a drive. And it's in, um, in that building just here, um, having its final rolling road session to be set up properly. Oh, I've just stalled it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love this thing. That's what old vehicles are about, right? They make you smile. You take them out every so often and just escape. Oh, subscribe, yeah, to the channel. Thank you. My gosh, even a Fiat 500 looks massive. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I got my knees around my chin. And he was in the doghouse for a long time. And this is how he dug himself out of the hole, which, I mean, let's be honest about it, is a really good way to dig yourself out of a hole. You know, I came home from work one day and said, just asked me, I think he just asked me to come and help him lift something or move something and we went into the garage and she was just there. She was just there. Yeah, and then he kind of just handed me the keys and, and said, you know, she's yours. It's been a little while since I've seen the car and it has been neglected. It's been sat in this, albeit dry, lockup, stashed away for about the last three years, waiting for the next stage of the build. It's gonna start really easily. I should think it'll make a bit of smoke. Anyway. Look. 
come on. Oh, that was quick. The fuel, the new fuel's got through. Oh, come on, darling. Yeah, definitely a car that you've got to kind of drive. Yeah. Would you makes... like that? Yeah, I think it is what it it's is. It's soft and it's wobbly. It is wobbly, yeah. And it's not fast at all. It's not. You can't overtake anybody in it. <laughs> it's on the face of well, it. I've just come back from shopping there and there was just a really slow, fat guy on a bike. <laughs> and, I, you know, they're going, yeah, I'm not probably not going to, I won't be able to take him before the other car comes. So overtaking is a thing of the past for me really. but has it made you a better driver do you think because you can't just barrel roll into big corners and because it leans I was, I was and already a great driver darling what are you talking about <laughs> all right we're immediately under the car greg will say hi in a minute this is the bull bar say hi hello <laughs> wrong camera he loves loves the world of TV and video. Um, so we're going to fit this on the gym. This is um, made by an Italian company, actually, and I'm going to unwrap it. And the Italian company is called Miss. I, I can't print Miss Miss Sutanida. I imported the car myself from San Diego, and it arrived about 36 hours before my wedding day. So it actually was our wedding car, even though it didn't run, and it had to be taken there on a trailer. So it was like a static ornament. The fact that it was supplied new to San Francisco in 68, I love, because obviously that was when Bullet was filmed and, and released into the cinema. Uh, so whoever bought this car was driving around San Francisco in 68 when the Bullet film was on the cinema. And I actually, uh, I did a home video um, on my honeymoon uh, where we did end up going to San Francisco and I did a tour, bought a book, and did a tour of all the places that were key points in the car chase of Bullet. So yeah, the Dodge Charger, one of the most popular cars on social media for me, uh, but actually not one of the most watched videos, strangely. I also bought another Charger this year, that one. I forgot to mention that, the Orenthetic Charger, the electric motorbike from the 70s that no one remembers or possibly cares about, but I do. And there it is. I'm going to be riding that on the road in 2021, I suspect other project cars that aren't mine but that other people's projects and that's something i'm going to do more on in the new year on the late break show the ferrari 250 gto resto mod who could forget that what an experience that was one of the hottest days of the year so naught to 60 is something like this right <laughs> And another amazing project car, and this was a feature I wanted to do for a long, long time, was the Aston Martin street legal drag car of Mark Todd. What a day that was. And then we get onto specials. Specials, I've grouped this sort of cluster of clips together because it's a bit of everything here. What I like about 
doing YouTube is it allows me to explore the sort of cultural human interest stories that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do on TV or other such media. One of those being one of my favourites, the Lord of Ford. Russell Lord, a chap down in Essex who's obsessed with Ford Escorts and he's also a jeweller, a master jeweller. This guy blew me away with what his talents were. You, you, you had to see it to believe it. Issues. You are never going to see something like this again, unless he builds another one, which he is, but it's a Mark I. Oh so you can see the hub, you can see the caliper, you can see the studs that are coming out of the hub, it's all there. Oh my gosh, Russell, it's insane. Yeah, all the track rollings work, all of it work. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's all, yeah. The, rally, the rally spotlights are diamonds. Yeah, they're one carat fifties at the top. I think that the headlights are 70 pointers each. So Most girls would dream of a 50 point. I was, I was just about to say, yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, big yeah. stones here. Yeah. From the Lord of Ford, the guy that made miniature precious metal and jeweled escorts and collected real escorts, to this next clip, the Land Rover Defender Electric from Electric Classic Cars and Selfridges. This was a really special video for me because I got contacted by Selfridges to produce this video and physically drive the car from the middle of nowhere into the shop. Uh, to be put on sale. You can have an old, obsolete, beautiful machine, but beneath that skin, it can have a totally different drivetrain, a totally different propulsion, one that's fully 21st century. Well, that's exactly what that is. That is a Land Rover Defender. You don't need me to tell you that. Everybody knows that. Even if you don't care about cars, you know that's a Defender. And yet, underneath the surface is 21st century, fully electric running gear from a Tesla. Guilt-free. SUV motoring. And then we had quite a divisive car actually, the MGB um, RBW. So this was uh, an, an, a brand new, I suppose, MG that was electric, um, made in the black country and a beautifully done car. And I was a bit nervous at first about this because I'm, I'm not massively interested in MGBs, but I know that they're the most popular classic car probably in Europe. Um, it turns out that you guys quite enjoyed watching that one. Rainbow, told you it was a summer's day. So this is the Mule, the second Mule. First one was the rubber bumper, original MG old car, late 70s. This is the first of the new shells, not quite finished, but this is the one that did all the hard miles, the R&D and all that kind of stuff. And which is why they don't mind if I just do stuff like this. which is not what I would normally do in a respectful British motor car like an MGB. It's not really appropriate, but then again, you know, it's a brand new, old looking thing. The last two clips here come under the special umbrella, I suppose, one of them being the Allegro barn find uh, that wasn't really a barn find, it was an old lockup. This was a car that hadn't been out since 1980, hadn't seen the light of day since about 1980. And me and my friend Tim dug it out um, and I filmed it uh, with just some basic cameras and you guys absolutely loved it. You love to hate it and then you love to love it as well. And I really enjoy doing the barn find episodes and I'm gonna be trying to do a couple more. In fact, I filmed one just before Christmas that will be going out in the new year. Oh, oh here's the money shot. We've got the ivy stumps out the way, clear around the garage door. It's almost the moment that we've all been waiting for, where we can open the door and reveal the majesty of the Series 1 Allegro Super Sport. Sport Special. Sport Special? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's what differentiates it from American muscle cars, then. <laughs> it's the only thing. <laughs> 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 Here it <Ta> -da! is. <laughs> now look, if it was just a normal Allegro, we wouldn't be making a video about it. But that, that little badge there, is the crucial element. And the other one is the classic car graveyard Urban X. I love Urban X. I used to do a lot of it as a as a kid when it wasn't called Urban X. It was just called snooping around, <laughs> and. When I got contacted by the Bearded Explorer about this huge semi-derelict um, scrapyard 
um, I had to go and visit. Um, and it was again on one of the hottest days of the year, actually. Uh, so it was quite sweaty, but highly rewarding. We found some rare stuff. BMW with sweet Pioneer speakers on the parser shelf. And then the P100 Ford pickup and then Mark II Cavalier and then name another vehicle. We've probably got it within spitting distance here. That is a very dead transit van with some kind of sign writing. It used to be yellow. You know what, it's not often I get to sit out in my own garden in winter in an easy chair. But I quite like it. I could get used to this. Now you're looking at the brown chairs and thinking, I recognise those chairs. And if you do, that's because these have become the, I suppose they've become notorious, infamous, uh, because of the Idle Chat series that we've started on the Late Break Show. The idea with this was, I guess, a sort of one-to-one -one or a sit-down interview in detail about the lives of people who are quite significant in the car world. And they've become more popular than I ever expected, which is brilliant uh, to hear. And they've also repurposed a set of chairs from my lounge that my wife doesn't want anymore, that I couldn't bear to throw away. So I, I squirreled them away in her lockup. And this is just uh, an excuse to really use them. And the first person on the idle chat chair was Ian Callum, the ex-design uh, director of Jaguar. So you've had a few Beatles. Four now, I think. You've got a Beetle right now? I've got a Beetle now, yeah. I've got a Beetle convertible. It's not here. I tried to sell it and I got to the point of selling it and I couldn't sell it. You realise you liked I it? I just still. love it. Yeah. I think partly it's reminiscent of the one I used to have when I was at, in, in Essex. I had a black one with a, a white roof and I had alloy wheels in it. And, and of course, in those days, this is early 80s, they were quite chic. Yeah. You know, you go into London, people you know, were driving yeah. Beetle convertibles. We do typically two parts of idle chat. One of them's just a chat on the chairs and one of them's a walk around their shed or garage about their own cars. This was Ian's car collection. It is a lot lighter than the standard one and it's got the carbon seats, the lightweight seats. It's got track suspension, it's got the right wheels. Uh, it's just, it's adorable to drive. This Absolutely. is the one you're driving home in tonight? Yes, I am, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the rain. But, but it's hey, okay because you know, it's, it's fine. It's waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> this obviously doesn't really need much introduction. No, I realised one day that I'd never owned a car that I'd worked on. So I thought the Vanquish is the one I really should have. Of course, I've driven a lot because I've got company cars, but I never actually owned one. The second idle chat and probably the most popular to date was a friend of mine who um, I've known for a long time, who now works for Top Gear called Chris Harris. And Chris was a brilliant chat. Um, he let me into his fairly private life. Um, we went into a ropey lockup with his Ferrari and his Peugeot 205 rally. And we just, we talked about everything. We talked about life, cars, mental health, state of mind, and the amazing and brutal world of Top Gear. And the first series of Chris Evans was, was not a good experience for any of us. You know, actually looking back, there are some films in that that I'm quite proud of, that I think were much better than people gave him credit for. But once, mm. Once someone, or once a population wants to hate something, you're in trouble. And I've never experienced hate like it, if I'm honest with you. It was. Is it tough? Oh, it's brutal. Properly brutal. I've got thick skin. But if you're waking up every day to hundreds of direct messages from people just going, you're shite, you're not Jeremy, you're whatever. And I, when, it, when that first season broadcast, I thought four or five episodes in, well, I, I made up my mind I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to stop immediately. This is the car that I really remember you for. Yeah. Because a lot of stuff has come and gone since you bought this. I bought this in, I think, I think I bought it in 06. Yeah. I bought it from the then publisher of Unity Publishing. I think I bought it blind, I'm sure I even saw it. Because I just, it's one of those cars I always wanted. So 205 Rally, this and Testarossa or 512 TR were the ones I always wanted. Yeah. And this is, uh, it's a sensational car. And then the third and most recent idle chat where I got the chairs out in, uh, in the middle of winter, just before Christmas, managed to get these videos out just before the, uh, the big Christmas day. And that was on British touring car legends, Mr. Jason Plato and Mr. Matt Neal. And I really wasn't sure how these videos were going to turn out, but they actually turned out all right, I thought. 
I chatted to them one-to-one -one before I brought them together. And that was because I wanted to try and get um, under their skin first to get an idea of their life in cars. How did their career start? What were their road cars like? It turns out they've both had some really cool road cars. Uh, Matt Neal, for a start, had an E30 M3 when he was quite young. Uh, Plato crashed a Lancia Integrale that was right-hand drive converted. <laughs> the story of just on its own about that particular car is awful. This was peak touring car era, wasn't it? Well, the 97 car, which this is a 98 car, was the finest touring car of that year by some margin. So I managed to get into the best seat. Wow. With the best, Alan Menu at that moment in time was the best touring car driver in the world. And he was my teammate. So what a fantastic yardstick. So uh, you went straight in, was like, I'm, I'm Oh, it was amazing, amazing. And, and Weird Williams did a, such a good jo job on me, you know, with the amount of testing they did and the amount of resource they put into me. Uh, it was amazing. This year, well, Dad's weapon of choice was the Mini. Off the yeah, list. yeah, he was known for the Minis. He did a few things, um, but he was known for the Minis. You had uh, production championship saloon cars, which was Group N. So I got in an M3 and we reshelled it into a motorsport shell. Okay. Um, and that suddenly it was a lightweight car and that was fast and um, we won the championship in it. So I went up to, a, to the Skyline and again won in Class A, which was good. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I sort of had my first toe in the water dipped into the BTC really. And when we brought them both together um, inside the Williams Heritage Centre, which I've got to say thank you to Williams Heritage Centre for letting us film in there because it's not open to the public. Um, what an exceptional place it was. Uh, I felt like we got some really good stuff out of Matt and Jason, who have been arch rivals for years and years and years, bitter rivals at times. Actually, it felt like a good closure of 2020, a kind of kind closure. Um, it's close, it's frenetic, it's aggro. Um, you know, watching any sport, all, I want to watch, all you want to watch, any of us want to watch, is uh, sports people in distress. <laughs> and that's what you get from start to finish of a, a British touring car weekend. Oh! Did you get that on camera? Yeah. That's a, that's a good sounding car. That's never gone past my house ever. That sounds great. Serious exhaust on that. So, on that note, on that exhaust note, we end the 2020 roundup of the Late Break Show. Thank you so much for watching um, or subscribing and joining the community, as it were, this year. Uh, rest assured, there's a lot more to come, I'm sure. And this variety that I'm going to try and maintain of EV, classic, kind of tinkering with car projects, future tech, car culture, brown chair culture, idle chat. So, yeah, thank you very much. And um, I'll be seeing you soon. Okay, hope you've had a really good Christmas festive period as well. I think we've all deserved it, right? <laughs>